do you demonstrate appreciation in the workplace based on individual love languages? Our guest today is Dr. Paul White. He is a psychologist, author, speaker, and uh, he makes work relationships work. He has taught around the world and worked with the top companies globally. He is a co-author of the best-selling book, The Five Languages of Appreciation in the Workplace, which has sold over 550,000 copies. He wrote that in conjunction with Dr. Gary Chapman. If you're familiar with the New York Times best-selling book, The Five Love Languages, which I read many, many years ago, 25 years ago at least, and just a fantastic book. And so I was really excited to hear about this book that's come out to, to talk about how this applies in the workplace. And so that's what we're going to talk about here today. We're going to talk about authentic appreciation. We're going to talk about how to how that applies to increasing employee engagement, lowering staff turnover, more positive work environments, and uh, higher profitability. So lots to come. So with that, Dr. White, thank you for being here. We're excited to have you. Thanks, Nicole. I'm glad to be with you. My pleasure. And I also want to do a shout out. I always like to do this, do a shout out to the team at Oscar Hamilton for introducing us. They have been sending me amazing guests for this show and we just, we just appreciate them so much. Speaking of appreciation. So let's talk about the common misconceptions that leaders have about appreciation in the workplace. Yeah, that's an important place to start because uh, if people have misbeliefs about appreciation, then they're not going to investigate or explore it. So uh, probably the, the first one in the work context is that a lot of leaders believe that showing appreciation is the same as employee recognition because uh, research has shown over 90% of companies in the U.S. have some form of employee recognition program. It may be as small as getting an automatic email on your birthday, but, you know, lots of times they're they're fuller than that. But, uh, yeah, we really uh, see a difference at recognition, which can be a good thing when it's uh, designed right and implemented consistently uh, really relates to performance about, you know, setting up goals, monitoring them and rewarding people for achieving those goals. And that's something that, you know, works well in companies and, and has for a long time. Uh, but we really believe that appreciation goes beyond that, that uh, our employees, our team members are not just employees, but they're people and people have value beyond performance. And so we really focus on appreciating the person as well as performance and they they uh, they overlap but um, and it's important because most employee recognition programs have been shown to only touch the top 10 or 15 percent of uh, their team members the sort of the stars and that leaves sort of your solid 50 to 60 percent in the middle that are good people they show up they do the work but they don't hear anything um, and we know that if uh, or when people don't feel valued or hear uh, any kind of appreciation, they're more likely to leave. I mean, uh, 79% of the people who leave a job say that they leave because they didn't feel valued and respected, uh, not for more money. So it's really important to understand that uh, we want to help that, not only the top group, but the middle group to, to feel valued and appreciated so that uh, they stick around and, and help us move forward. Um, another misconception is uh, that appreciation is about words, right? That we say things, we praise them, we, you know, give them a compliment. And that's fine. It's a good thing. But uh, we, we've done research. I have over 375,000 people that have taken our online assessment. And uh, less than half of all employees choose words as the primary way that they want to be appreciated. So if you only use words from the get-go, you're sort of missing half of your team members. And so that, that's not a, you know, a, a winning proposition to, to move forward successfully. Third misconception is that um, the goal of showing appreciation is to make people feel good and feel happy. And yeah, we want that to happen, but that's not really the primary goal in the workplace. Uh, I sort of use the example of oil in a machine. You know, you've got a machine and have parts that move together and all that. And without oil, you know, there's friction, there's heat, maybe sparks get stuck. Um, and, and I think appreciation is like that in an organization. It's sort of like the oil that helps the team work together uh, well. And in our book, uh, we have over second chapters on sort of the return investment of appreciation. We have over 50 citations of how uh, team members feeling valued improves uh, the functioning of the organization. We can go into detail that in, in a little bit. And then the last misconception that 
that's really common is that it's mainly for leaders, managers, supervisors to communicate. And clearly we want that to happen, but it's, it's too much responsibility really for managers to have to carry that full weight of showing appreciation to everybody. And we've actually found that uh, helping team members learn how to communicate appreciation to one another is far more effective um, because more and more uh, as uh, we get new generations in the workforce, they're really focused more on peer and collegial relationships. In the old days, there was a saying, you know, you don't leave a job, you leave a manager. I think it's less true now that people, if they feel supported and, and uh, work together with their team, they can handle some tension with their supervisor. So we, our goal is to teach teams, including the leaders, but teams how to show appreciation to one another versus just laying it all on the, on the supervisor or manager. Yeah, you talked about that 50 to 60 percent in the middle that don't hear anything. It's kind of like that no news is good news, but not necessarily in this case. And right. I love what you said there about the words of affirmation, the things that we say. I remember years ago having a client say to me, why do I have to tell my employees? Thank you. They get paid. And I was like, well, yeah, okay. So if you want their head to show up at work, you can you can do that. But if you want their heart to show up, then it's going to take a little bit more than that. Talk about the five love languages. And again, when I said I read it 25 years ago, man, it was eye-opening for me to yeah. understand what my love language was. And I remember because I was in business back then, and that I was like, how does this apply to the workplace? So I so appreciate, again, that you put this book together to translate it into this particular context. So sure. talk about what they are. Yeah. So and just to clarify, we talk about the love languages in personal relationships, right? With, yeah. your, with your significant other spouse, your kids and friends, and then the five languages of appreciation in the workplace. And they're the same in name as the five love languages, but they look different, obviously, in, in how they're applied. So first is words of affirmation. Um, and those are words that are affirming. We're affirming the value of uh, the other person, of what they're doing and, and how that's important. <clears throat> and we teach a model of use a person's name. <clears throat> we like to hear a name if you're writing it it'd be good to spell their name correctly. <laughs> um, and then give specifics about what they're doing or showing that you value and then why it's important either to you, the organization or to your clientele. And it is the largest single group uh, as far as people choosing that. It's about 45% of the workforce. So that's a big group, but like, like we saw or talked about, it's, it's less than half. So uh, the second one is quality time and quality time actually it sort of led us to research. We've done a bunch of research with generations and work settings and that um, it really sort of breaks down different generationally. In the old days, uh, of which I'm probably the part, uh, is, you know, people wanted time with their managers. They wanted focus, attention, be able to meet with, listen to, learn from their managers and supervisors. It's less true now. I mean, still may be there, but more and more, it's more about people want to hang out with their colleagues. They want to go to lunch together, go out after work, uh, maybe even work collaboratively on a project. So it's about time with people that you value and by them spending their time, which is really now is our most important resource, um, they're communicating that they value you. And so um, I, I tell older leaders, I say, just because you have a team member who has quality time as their language, doesn't mean they want time with you. You may be wonderful, you may be great, but you know they may want to hang out with their friends after work and that kind of thing. And that's about 26% uh, of the workforce, about one out of every four. Uh, acts of service is the third one, and it's not rescuing low-performing colleagues. It's really something simple uh, that you can do during the day or week that helps make their day and week go better. Uh, probably two best examples. One is if you're working on a time limited project and you're just banging away trying to get through it, so what somebody can, can do to help you with that. And it might be maybe to take, you know, a part of the project. It might be to uh, take on your emails and phone calls for a day or so, so you can stay focused on, on, on the project. Um, the other setting is like in clinical settings or service settings, it's when everybody shows up all at once and there's a big line, you know, waiting to be served, how can you help out to help make that go better uh, for your colleague? 
And that's about uh, 21%. So one of out of every five um, uh, employees have that. It's important to know because for access service people, lots of times words just don't get it. I mean, they sort of see words are cheap. Don't tell me you support me, show me, you know. And so uh, you can actually create a fence by just telling them stuff all the time and never helping out. Uh, fourth language is tangible gifts. It's not bonuses, raises, those kinds of things. That's, you know, an employee employer contract. It's more small stuff that shows that you're getting to know your colleagues as, as people, what they like. It could be their favorite cup of coffee in the morning or a favorite snack. Uh, maybe you buy them lunch or get a gift card to their favorite place that they like to go for lunch. Could be maybe a magazine about their uh, favorite sports team, you know, the, the Chargers in your case, you know, or, or whatever. Um, or and it can even be something online. And it could be, let's say they're starting to coach their kid's soccer team and you find a, a website that's got really good training uh, activities for that and you send them that. So it's that you're getting to know them personally uh, and, and reaching out that way. And then physical touch, which is always the one that people go, oh, I don't know, you know, um, it's, it, it's interesting. It's less than 1%. By the way, tangible gifts is about 7%. So if you use gifts, and this is a problem with a lot of employee recognition programs, they think, you know, they give gifts, but they're, the worst thing you do is just give everybody the same thing because it doesn't mean anything to that person or that you really thought about them. Uh, but physical touch is less than 1%. And largely it's spontaneous celebration, right? It's, it's a high five when you finish a project, maybe a fist bump when you solve a problem. Could be a congratulatory handshake. And it differs both regionally in the U.S. and also culturally. We, uh, you know, our uh, resources are in multiple languages. And so our Latin and Hispanic friends are more sort of physically demonstrative than maybe our Northern European friends who are like, don't touch me. Or in New York, this is what physical touch looks like there. It's, hey, you know, <laughs> it's just sort of across the room. So um, it happens. We, we address it. Uh, we don't assess it because... Uh, it doesn't happen that often. And there's, you know, a high negative kind of reactivity to people that have been unfortunate victims of sexual harassment. So we stick on the other four primarily. So, you know, I, there's a few things that I could come up when I was uh, listening to you share those um, in terms of the, uh, the effort. So for example, a leader who thinks that tangible gifts or HR department that thinks tangible gifts is the, the solution, they go to great lengths to figure out how to do compensation plans. Like I think about when we were talking about profitability, you know, you're spending all this money on things that people don't actually want. And right. so, you know, how do you find out what people want? Because everybody's different. You can't do the cookie cutter approach, right. just like you can't do it in personal relationships. Doesn't work there. Same thing here. Everybody's different. We have our own you know, needs that we need to get met. Right. And then we have the other person. And then when you have a team and you might have hundreds, maybe thousands of people, maybe you're only responsible for those leaders, but it's got to get disseminated down. How right. do you, how do you figure that out? Yeah, What's the right so approach to the right, yeah. you know, to the person? Well, you know, uh, different people as far, and we have tried different things. I mean, asking somebody, you know, if uh, I want to show you appreciation, how should I do that? That's a weird question in our culture. <laughs> and, and, and they may not know. You, and they may not know. And they're probably yeah. going to say, I don't know, tell me thanks. You know, so th that doesn't help you a whole bunch. Um, and secondly, in personal relationship, you can sort of watch what they do or how they respond to different kinds of actions. You don't have that many data points in the workplace. And so that doesn't really work. And so that's why we created the online assessment. It's called the Motivating by Appreciation Inventory. A code comes with the book. But you can also buy codes just for your team because uh, not everybody wants to read the book. Um, and it identifies a person's primary language, the ones most important to them, their secondary one. Those two can be pretty powerful. And then their least valued one, which is the sort of your blind spot. It's the one you don't think about, but you may have team members that have that language. And so you got to sort of think about that. And then we found that just knowing the language wasn't sufficient. So we went back and retooled it and after we identify a person's primary language, we then give them a list of a whole bunch of different actions that they can choose. And not only the actions, but from whom they want it. Because let's say quality time, they may want to get together and go to a sporting event with their colleagues, but they don't want to invite their supervisor. So you can sort of clarify that. And then we've got a group profile that we can create for a team 
And so that's really been uh, sort of the most impactful way that we found because um, it, it also then gives sort of the, uh, the, the fodder for be able to discuss it together as a group because you don't want it just one-on-one. -on -one. You want to help the team know how to show appreciation. We even have little sort of cubicle posters that people can put their language and actions, that kind of stuff. Because it's about changing culture, right? And changing culture is about changing individual behaviors. And if you do that over time uh, across a lot of people, then your culture is going to shift. Yeah, I think of it as like a language, just like I've taught DISC as a personality tool and yeah. understanding different personality types. And so it becomes a language as part of the culture is that people who new people that come to the team begin to learn the language of that, of that culture and, and how, and I mean, appreciation is at the top of the list. You got to, you got to understand how to, how to do that. Yeah, yeah. Because, and part of it is, I mean, one of the main sort of uh, obstacles that people throw is like, I'm too busy for this. I can barely get my own work done. How am I supposed to yeah. do this? And we actually found that when team members feel valued, you become less busy dealing with stupid little things that really aren't on point as far as, you know, first of all, people not showing up, not showing up on time, calling in sick when they're really not, not doing their work the way they're supposed to, um, complaining about stupid little things that don't matter them at the size of their monitor, whether they got a window or a parking spot. And those sort of fall away. And I commit to to leaders, I'm not here to create another to-do list for you. You already got at least two, like your regular one and then your project one. You don't need an appreciation one. And what we found is that we can teach people how to do what they're almost doing or doing, but not quite exactly right and tweak it a little bit and become more effective because we don't want everybody to write everyone a note. We don't want everybody to go and check in on people. We want to give you not only the language, but the specific action that's going to be meaningful to that person. And it doesn't take much when you hit, when you hit the target, it, it really makes a difference. So uh, it helps you become uh, probably more busy on the things that matter rather than the things that don't. Yeah. It reminds me of a, a story years ago, I was working with this group of uh, attorneys and there was, they had an assistant. I had, we had this assistant that was kind of like for our group and she used to come in in the morning. And, and the funny thing is, is when I first got there, she, she proceeded to insult me with the way that she <laughs> approached me. And I was like, well, this is a good start. <laughs> so yeah. then she started to come in every morning when I was there, I was only there three days a week. And so she'd come in and she would start to recount her weekend or she'd recount the day before and all she just mm. talking, talking like 20, 30 right. minutes. And I was just like, I have piles of work to do, <laughs> right? I don't have time for this. Right. And, you know, and so it's, it, it was, uh, it was like, don't you see this? Right. And so then I started to think about it and I said, okay, well, you know what, clearly this is something that she needs. So what I started doing is I started taking a few minutes and actually took less time when I paid attention. Mm -hmm. right. And I was just thinking about that quality time is to just listen to her talk about whatever she needed to talk about. And when I did this, the first time I did this, it occurred to me that like halfway during the day, how productive she was. Like mm, she was happy. Mm. Now I've, yeah. I've got my 10 minutes of, I've been able to share all these things right. and now I can go on my happy, merry way and do the thing I'm supposed to be doing. And then she was much more willing to help me when I needed the help, even though she was supposed to, again, same right. thing, right? Head, heart. Yeah. She was supposed to help me, but she was reluctant to help me. And uh, it just made all the difference. So, so yeah, that investment of time was worth it in spades. And literally I, I haven't worked there and I think it's probably been almost 20 years. And uh, she just recently sent me a, a, an email just yeah. asking how I was and so forth. And yeah. I'm like, wow, yeah. how far we've come. <laughs> so. Yeah. And that, and it's a, a, an important point about quality time that for a lot of people, it is focused attention and doing something while listening, what we would call a distraction or, you know, multitasking doesn't work in this sense. They really want your attention. They want to know you're listening and, and you can manage that versus if you keep, you know, work on your computer, looking at your cell phone, it doesn't get the message through to them. So it's really wasted time on your part. Yeah. Talk about blind spots. You know, like yeah. we have our own blind spots and we don't know what we don't know. And, and then let's say we have people that 
we're leading and working with, collaborating with. And it, so how do we how do we develop and improve upon our blind spots yeah. and recognize what needs to happen, you know, or what somebody needs from us in a particular situation? You know, it's a great opportunity to demonstrate that you care and want to show appreciation to somebody, but that you don't really know how to, or you know, it's a weak spot for you. And so, uh, you know, in our assessment, we identify that, that least valued language. And I think it's an opportunity to, to talk to them and say, hey, look, I see your language is, you know, let's say words and my, that's my lowest one and it's your, your top one. And it's like, I got to think I'm missing the mark here sometimes or I haven't given you. And so help me out. Um, and let me know what kinds of words or, or when, because some people, one of the things we found is that 40% of all employees don't want to go up in front of a large group to be uh, recognized and shown appreciation that way. And it's higher, for, it's about 65% for administrative assistance and, and different uh, groups have different rates, but you want to do it in the way that's meaningful to them. So you have a discussion and say, and, and, and this is where, you have to have be a little bit, you know, courageous to say it. And, you know, if I mess up, you know, let me know, you know, and I'll tell you that right now, one of the key opportunities that leaders miss is when somebody handles a difficult situation. Well, that is gold. And you want to say, man, Marie, they were tough clients and they came in and they were sort of, you know, at you and you handled that really well. If you don't catch those, you've really missed an, uh, uh, an important opportunity because if you don't say anything or don't do something to uh, acknowledge that, they're like, well, why did I put myself out there? And, you know, well, you know, why should I do this? So uh, that's key. But just having a discussion. And if it feels weird or awkward doing it one on one, do it in a group, you know, because, again, you want to facilitate uh, team members showing appreciation to one another. And lots of times we hear a term, whether well, it's quality time, you say, oh, I got to spend time with them when that may not be really what it is. And so you, you listen so that you can you know, really hit the mark for that. When I think about the humanity of that, there's a lot more talk about bringing the humanity back into the workplace. And, and, uh, and I mean that from even like from a leader standpoint, that the leader it used to be that the leader knew everything, had all the answers yeah. and they had their, the yeah, they had their, their wall and their mask on. So they didn't have that vulnerability to say, hey, you know what? I don't have all the answers. One of the things certainly that COVID did was put everybody in in a an unknown environment where it was like, look, I don't have the answers. I mean, you couldn't fake it because you just didn't know as a leader, right. Right? right? It's like, oh, I know how to handle this. No, you don't, right? right? So we're all in this together. And so this is a great opportunity for people to see, wow, the leader is saying, I don't have all the answers as it relates to this. And maybe it's a safer way to do it versus doing it when it comes to innovation and where the company should go and all that kind of stuff. Appreciation, uh, inquiry type of thing. So that was one thing I just wanted to highlight there. I think that's a great opportunity. And then I was thinking about the timing because you mentioned just briefly about the timing of, of appreciation. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, you know, uh, with regards to words, one, one way of communicating is th through writing, right? And so in the old days, you know, a handwritten note was sort of, you know, the thing, when you, if you got a nice gift from your grandma or whatever, you know, and sort of ingrained in us. But one of the things that we found is that younger employees, especially younger, like 20 something guys don't really value a handwritten note that much. But what's important is the speed in which you get back to them. I mean, if you think about their culture, it's pretty fast. It's pretty present oriented. And so if they've done something you want to call attention to, you better get to them in 24 or 48 hours or you've moved into history, right? You've missed that. And so clearly, I mean, it doesn't have to be right on the spot, but you, you don't want to wait six months and say, hey, you remember back in January when you did this? You know, that's just not going to have any impact. I mean, part of it is a behavioral aspect of, you know, you see the behavior and you want to call attention to it, it's more likely to occur again. So, and, and sometimes you forget, right? And I think it's better to, to call it and say, you know, man, I really blew it here. I should have said or done something back then, but I, I want to let you, I did notice it. So, you know, we make mistakes. It's okay to sort of reference that, but as much as possible, you want to keep it in the present. So um, talk about the, um, 
the ways that we get our needs met. So we've been talking about helping others, right? Mm -hmm. But if I know that I don't have a need met from, let's say, somebody that, that I'm working for or people that I'm working with, you know, it's like, whose responsibility is it to get our needs met? <laughs> well, that's a great question. And um, I would say, because I, uh, we've also done research and worked with toxic workplaces and in toxic workplaces, you clearly don't get your needs met. I mean, you got to protect yourself. And sometimes there's some situations uh, and hopefully sort of limited time, but where you need to get your input, your resources, your support from other places. And whether that's family or friends or other colleagues that you've worked with before that you know you still meet with for lunch or whatever, um, or in other ways. And so we need to know that we are valued, that we're important. I mean, yes, we need to motivate ourselves. I mean, that's sort of the, the foundation, but it's nice to know that somebody else values what we do, you know? And uh, there are some people that just only don't ever say anything, right? Or, or don't think about it. And, and there's some people like the person you mentioned about, you know, we pay them. Well, you can have that approach, but if you do, you're going to have a higher turnover rate than all your competitors, which is going to really interfere with you being able to serve and produce like you, you should. So I, I think there's both the aspect of being open and saying, hey, you know, because one of the things that we find is it's uh, it's leaders that are least willing to share their language of appreciation with their team. And so how, you know, what's a team member supposed to do? And, you know, there's the question of if they're trying to manipulate you or, or try to get, you know, brownie points or whatever. Over time, and we, and we talk about authenticity, you know, and that if you don't appreciate somebody, don't try to fake it. But over time, you're going to figure out if they're trying to, to manipulate you. So I wouldn't react to that either, even as an employee. I mean, if your boss or supervisor or the vice president does something, you know, let them know. I mean, it doesn't often go up the ladder. Uh, 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 and so the, that's an important message. But at some point, you know, we're responsible for our own health and we've got to figure out where we're going to get it, whether that's here or someplace else and, so, and or some combination. Yeah. What I hear in that too, is the taking responsibility for your own needs to an extent. And then if you actually, cause you were talking about figuring out what the leader's love language is or a language of appreciation is, then uh, you can, you can demonstrate it. It's like that law of reciprocity. When you start to engage in that, right. then uh, you're more likely to, to create the type of relationship that would allow it to come back to you. Speaking mm -hmm. of toxic workplaces, and I'm always amazed at how many toxic workplaces there are with all the information <laughs> that's out there, but that's a whole yeah. other story. Yeah. When you have toxic workplaces, which I'm sure you've had many that you've gone into, how do you turn that around because there is that suspicion, like you're just doing this because you want to increase your profitability and, and uh, get more performance out of me, you know? So how do you, how well, do you, well, where does that start? There's, yeah, there's a couple entry points. One is, and we found that there's sort of three main components of a, a truly toxic workplace. One is that it's built on six systems, sick systems, meaning that there's not a good sense of accountability um, there's an indirect communication. People are sort of just free to do what they want, or they let behaviors go that really shouldn't go. And one of the key parts there is to really emphasize and facilitate direct communication that, you know, you don't go around somebody, you don't sort of hint at stuff um, or, you know, just use sarcasm. You say, hey, this is what I see and, and, uh, and what I think needs to happen. Um, second part are toxic, toxic leaders. And toxic leaders are tough because lots of times they're pretty good at what they do professionally, but they sort of kill or wound people around them, uh, not physically, but emotionally. And they have sort of this revolving door. And, uh, you know, there are some, I would say, unique situations where you can help a toxic leader change. But typically, they're sort of in our part of the country in the Midwest, we have walnut trees. 
And walnut trees have toxic roots and toxic leaves. And so nothing else grows around them. You get walnuts, but you don't get anything else. And I, I sort of think most of the time the toxic leader's got to go uh, because they're just going to continue to create a, a poisoned you know, environment. And the third part are dysfunctional colleagues. And those are people that blame, make excuses. Um, they uh, sort of are really good at helping other team members get into conflict, you know, sort of like, let's see you and him fight. Um, and uh, again, the accountability part is there. And, and, and part of it is setting boundaries. Um, but I think a key part, if you as an individual are in a toxic workplace, a starting point is you need to take care of yourself because by definition, a toxic workplace is unhealthy. It's not good for you. It could eventually really, you know, destroy you if you go too far. And so you need to set limits and, and, you know, there's symptoms. I mean, it's like, you're not sleeping, right. You're starting to have physical symptoms. People, your people that are close to you are saying, you know, you're sort of irritable all the time. When am I supposed to talk to you? Uh, and because, you know, you've just got this sort of sucking uh, of your energy coming out of you. And so you've got to set some boundaries, find somebody that's healthy uh, to talk to and bounce ideas. And you say, you know, I, I thought this wasn't the right thing to do, but they're saying this is OK. Help me understand this. You know, and sometimes you get fogged in a toxic workplace. So take care of yourself and then uh, be open, honest, at least. But you know, toxic leaders will use you and use you up for their purpose. That they're, they're all about themselves and they'll use people and systems and information. And so you can't just give them everything because they'll just, they'll, they'll suck you dry. Yeah. And one of the things I actually wanted you to also touch on too is, um, which kind of goes on the flip side, you can have toxic leaders. You can also have people that are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And here you are trying to create a culture of appreciation. Right. And they're dropping the ball. They're just yeah. not doing what they're supposed to be doing. How do you balance that, that requirement, that performance, that need for performance and getting things done, doing what they're supposed to be doing and also appreciating them? Like what are some practical yeah. ways that you can actually give that feedback so that it builds the person up, but addresses the behavior? Yeah. And that's an important point because, you know, whether or not they're intending to not do what they're supposed to, or maybe they're just new in their career and are still sort of learning work ethics and values and so forth, um, you need to address those. And so we really emphasize that showing appreciation and, and often it's a non-work thing. It, it could be like, man, I'm just really impressed with that you're, you know, training for a half marathon. That's just cool. You got the discipline to do that or to maybe a single mom and say, and, you know, Lucille, I'm just super impressed with how much you love and care for your kids. You're just really good at that. And that's neat. Keep that separate and then deal with the, the, the performance issue. And you can even say, you know, I love that you love your kids, but you got to get here on time. You know, we just, the way work works here, you got to be here on time. And so you still hold them accountable to their performance. And sometimes, like if we go back to dysfunctional colleagues, you actually write the behaviors into their performance, right? I mean, it's about engaging collaboratively with your peers, being supportive and positive. One of the key things that we found for sort of helping start to turn toxic workplaces around is one, uh, given that negativity is a, sort of a hallmark characteristic is don't contribute to the negative comments, you know, just don't pile on. And secondly, try to turn the conversation to something positive. It doesn't have to be about that. It could be, hey, you know, man, I'm really thankful that it's cooled off here and, you know, we're past sort of the heat wave. Or, man, I'm so glad, uh, you know, I don't work outside anymore and get to work in air conditioning. So you, that sort of throws water on the flames of the negativity and at least gives you a little bit more neutral ground to, to, to move forward from there. Oh, that's good. That's good. You have a, a gift for us and uh, for our listeners and related to your online assessment. Talk about that, because I think that's that's a great next step for people to. Yeah. To yeah. I'd like to, to offer uh, your listeners um, to get a sample report of our inventory, because I think it's fair to see what you're getting before you buy it. Right. And so if if they'll email me at yes 
Dr. Paul, just yes, drpaul at gmail.com. Uh, I'll send you um, a sample report of our inventory so you can take a look at it, see what it uh, provides and gives to you. And, um, and then also our, our uh, sort of mothership website is appreciationatwork.com. It's the word at appreciationatwork.com. And we've got information about the book, about the assessment, and we have uh, sort of an online train the trainer course for for leaders and uh, HR professionals to be able to take their teams through the process of, of uh, learning how to show appreciation to one another. That's awesome. Thank you so much. This is when I, when I said, when I um, heard from Oscar Hamilton and I thought about this, there's so many leadership consultants out there that are coming at it from a different, different angles. And this is so intentional, so specific in the way that you're doing it, that I think it's, uh, it's hugely valuable. And uh, so I appreciate you. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that we ought to talk about before we wrap up? Yeah. You know, I find with leaders and I work, our, our resources are used anywhere from government, schools, medical, uh, small businesses, um, multinationals, all that, that um, sometimes leaders get, focused on the big picture and I was like, okay, we got to do this. And that's great. But then they wind up never really getting started. And so I just say, start somewhere with someone, you know, and, and if you don't know what their language is, that's fine. Use words. If you uh, are specific about what you value about them and do it privately, it could be in writing or, or in person. Uh, and then watch the, the response. I think, I think you'll be positively surprised at how people respond. The more specific you are, the more likely they are to view it as authentic and genuine. If you're general, we actually done some uh, poll and found that people don't like to hear good job because it's too vague. It doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't take anything to give. So be specific and, and communicate that and, uh, and start. And, and that's a good way to go. Awesome. Out of curiosity, how did you get into this and, and <laughs> yeah, this to so, be your specialty? Yeah. So I'm a psychologist by training mm. and uh, mid career. Um, I started consulting with family owned businesses because I grew up in the context of a family business and so, sort of understood some of it at least and started working with business succession planning around family issues, the family parts that intertwine. And I was working with a, a family in North Carolina talking to the dad, I said, you know, how do you think the plan's going? He said, it's going well, my son's stepping up, I think it's gonna work out. I walk across the hall and uh, ask his son the same question. He says, this is a disaster, it's never gonna work, I can't ever please my dad, uh, which I could understand. And, uh, and at the same time, my wife and I were reading the five love languages, I think probably the second or third time, sort of slow learner that way. And uh, I thought, you know, I wonder if this, could work, you know, it worked. And so I actually pursued Dr. Chapman for a year um, and then uh, got in to see him and pitched the idea. And we uh, started working on the assessment and then training and, and the book from there. So that's, that's how it, it came about. Well, I always know there's a story behind it. And you talked about family businesses. I can relate to that. My dad used to, what well, my brother worked with my dad and my mom was in there. And I always thought that there was three Jansons in a family business was enough because oh, yeah. my, my mother would be the one going between the two and yeah. my dad and my brother were exactly alike. And so my dad would fire him three times a week. My brother would quit <laughs> three times a week and, you, you know, what does he do? And, you know, all this. and, but this information, that's why reading books like this really helped me to understand my family, understand I did get into business. There was uh, a time for many years I was in business and partnered with my parents in business and understanding my dad's personality and his uh, language of appreciation or lo and love language and my mom and the different dynamics, it really, uh, it, it, it changed everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, cool. so, Great so time. good. Well, Dr. Paul, thank you again so much for being here. We're gonna make sure all of the links to your website, drpaulwhite.com, also appreciation in the workplace, the, the other website that you um, talked about. We're going to make sure that's in the, in the show notes, your book, um, the inventory, how they can reach out to you and get a sample of that. We'll make, excuse me, we'll make sure that that's all in the show notes for our listeners. And I always say leaders of transformation, take 
action. So this has been wonderful. Dr. Paul has given us amazing insights into this. I encourage you to go get a copy of the book. Even if you think that you're a great communicator and appreciate your people really well, go get a copy of the book, do the assessment, start to understand not just from where your perspective is, like I'm a good person and I do things the right way, is to actually look at it from the perspective of your team, from the perspective of the other person who you're working with to really just in like in your example with a family business you know, the, the, the father said, everything's going great. The son goes, this will never work. <laughs> okay. So that you can get re- the reality of how effective you are and not from a place of judgment, but from a place of opportunity on being able to grow and, uh, and really communicate to people the way that they need to be communicated to. I, I love what Tony Robbins says. Communication is the response you get. So it's not so much what you say, it's how it's being delivered that is so important. So I encourage you to do that. We'd love to hear your stories and your feedback on how this has impacted you. You can go on leadersoftransformation.com and reach out to us there. And I would encourage you, if you enjoyed this, please share it with a friend that helps to get this message out there so more and more people can bring this material into their workplaces and into their lives and be able to create more effective relationships. We appreciate you. Thanks so much for being here. And we look forward to seeing you next week on another episode of the Leaders Transformation.